Uh, yeah, I think that has started now. Yeah, okay. So a warm welcome to everyone to the 23rd lecture in the SOAS World Philosophies lecture series. Um, and this, this is a series we've been um, organizing since uh, January 2021. Um, where we are able to expand the horizons of philosophical thought and um, invite um, important and interesting guests uh, to uh, tell us and uh, give us the opportunity to learn from them about the ideas of different philosophical traditions uh, from African to Indian to Buddhist and so on and so forth. And today we have the opportunity to um, gaze uh, very interestingly and the Islamic tradition uh, of uh, human thought, of philosophical thought. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to have with us today um, Ambassador Akbar Ahmed, um, who is a distinguished professor and the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University and a Wilson Center Global Fellow in Washington, D.C. Among his many prestigious uh, titles and post he has had in the past. He was a Pakistan High Commissioner to the UK and Ireland. Um, I think uh, uh, Professor Ahmed is one of those um, scholars of Islamic thought that has really, really uh, written quite a number of works um, on that tradition of um, philosophy and thought, uh, some of which include uh, Discovering Islam uh, in I think 1988, uh, Islamic Thought, A Short Introduction to the Muslim World, uh, Journey into Islam, uh, Europe, Journey into Europe, Islam, Immigration and Identity. And the one that actually caught my interest, uh, which is why I wrote to him uh, and asked if he could give this lecture, was um, the 2021, uh, The Fly Man, uh, where he looks at um, the sort of um, uh, dialogue that happens between Aristotle and other Islamic philosopher in the golden age of uh, Islamic philosophy, and I suspect we'll be hearing um, some some something about that today. Uh, the theme of his talk today is uh, the golden age of Islam and the secrets of the Im ethos. Uh, Professor Ahmed, you are most welcome, and uh, you have our attention. But just before you begin, I would like to ask everyone uh, to please. Remain muted. Let's give um, uh, Professor Ahmed the floor to um, give his lecture, and we will have um, enough time for comments and questions when he's done. So you have our attention, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elvis. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this very prestigious series. I love the title. I love the intent of the series. So I'm really grateful to you. I'm grateful to Suez. As an alum, I'm really honored and delighted to be back again. So my talk will be in three parts, after which I'll be happy to engage in a Q&A. The first part of my talk will give us a glimpse of the golden age of Islam. It will only be a glimpse, but it will show you the richness of that era. The second part will provide an explanation of how the golden age came about. That is the philosophy behind the golden age. We are trying to get to the core of that philosophy. And finally, the third part will point to the lessons we can learn from the golden age for our world today. So the practical application of those ideas. Now, I myself first visited Andalusia in the 1960s when I was an undergraduate in England. And I hitchhiked all the way to Andalusia. In those days, Spain was still a traditional society. Trains were very traditional, slow. People would say the train would stop, people would get on. Sometimes they had a goat with them. Sometimes the market produced where they were going to sell their goods and they would pull the chain, the train would stop. It was really something like pre-modern. And people were warm and friendly and appeared to be very much rooted in their own culture. And they looked on the Muslim past, remember this is Andalusia, with a mixture of pride as they owned that culture, but also satisfaction because they had in the end triumphed over it. But it was not abrasive, it was inclusive. And I felt a strange nostalgia uh, as if though I'd been here before. And I talked to many Muslim scholars later and they said they felt a similar emotion. And I call this the Andalusian syndrome. 
So although I'm an anthropologist looking at society and uh, analyzing society and rights to passage and all the usual features that anthropologists study, I'm also acutely aware that we need to place the, the anthropology of this era within a larger theological frame to try to tease out what we are aiming to explain. A friend asked me, why do you write about the golden age, even the title of this lecture? And I gave a reply, which is simple, and yet for me profound, which is that this period of history that's a thousand years ago, makes me feel proud and happy. I feel for once we Muslims are shown as noble and good and successful and kind as brilliant scientists and poets. No one points a finger and says Muslims are terrorists and misogynists and worthless. That makes me happy. And I believe that is an emotion we can easily share. So Andalusian society as scholars, and we are talking as scholars in this session, it provides us an empirical, em empirical evidence of the relationship between cause and effect. We have evidence of the cause through what I am calling the ilm ethos, and I'll explain it uh, shortly. And we also have the effect. So we have the ilm ethos, and the effect is the intellectual and cultural output of Andalusia, and I'll also comment on that. Now, Andalusia is not the only center at this stage of history. There were other centers during the Golden Age. There's Baghdad, there's Bukhara, there's Samarkand. They were flourishing. But we are going to focus on Andalusia. And I believe this is important because we do have a current heated debate and discussion around Muslims in Europe. So if there's a problem due to the Muslim presence in Europe, then in Andalusia, we have a European solution. And it is this concept and practice of what the Spanish call la convivencia or coexistence, a word associated with the golden age that I would like people to think about and really discuss in the hope of tackling some of the uh, problems of our time. Now, why am I calling it the secrets of the ill mythos? Simply because so few people know about the golden age or the scale of its achievements, or indeed its potential to solve some of our contemporary problems. We, don't, we do not even seem to know the causes of the rise of the great dynasties of the past. Now, some scholars would say, some Islamic scholars especially, they would attribute this to Islam. Some would say it's the pleasant climate. Others to the good fortune or charisma of the rulers. So if we can tease out the secret, we can suggest it can perhaps be applied to other societies. So today, Islam, especially after 9-11, is equated to violence. We know Many, in many parts of the world, we have examples of uh, individual men committing violence. We have groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda playing havoc across the Middle East. And we have very often Muslims being falsely blamed. For example, the stabbing of three young girls in a school in the UK recently. So again, we have a stereotype of Muslims in today's world. And as the violence continues unabated, it is clear that there is a failure of understanding. So let me take you a different time and place to look for answers on how to promote better understanding. Let us look at Andalusia a thousand years ago. Let me give you again a glimpse, only a glimpse into the depth and scale of some of those who are bringing change at that time and whose achievements affect us even today. So let me start with someone like Haitham who invented the camera obscura or the pinhole camera, which would eventually become the movie projector. Just think of it. Hollywood, all the films, the television, all go back to Haitham a thousand years ago. Or Avicenna's medical books, which were used by physicians for the next few centuries in Europe. Or al Jazari, who wrote the book of knowledge and mechanical devices. He invented the elephant clock and water clock and was called the father of robotics. Ibn Tufel wrote the first philosophic novel about a man on a desert island, which would impact Europe. You recall Robinson Crusoe, the stories inspired from Tufel's work. Or Ibn Rushd, who translated and built on the Greeks, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, 
and took philosophy to new heights. Above all, he reconciled the debate within religious circles between faith and reason. So this was a great debate uh, until this time. And Ibn Rushd helps clarify this. He can say it can be both. He, he combined, he fused the two. Or Khwarizmi, who developed algebra and algorithms. Just think of it, algebra, algorithms. It's coming from this great philosopher. Now, where there are intellectual giants, there is also the clash of intellect and ego. And one of the most celebrated clashes took place between two of the most famous scholars of that time, Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd, who I've mentioned. The former seemed to attack philosophy and his practitioners in his The Incoherence of the Philosophers. Ibn Rush replied, wrote an academic response to this with his book, The Incoherence of the Incoherence, in which he defended the adaptation of Aristotelian philosophy into Islamic thought. So you can see it's a time of great intellectual ferment and, ferment and clashes. It's not simply a time of uh, material progress. It's also a time of great intellectual progress. And let me take two names as bookends to that period. Abbas ibn Farnas at one end, early in the period, and Umar Khayyam at the other end. So two, two names, well worth remembering. Now, Ibn Farnas tied wings on his shoulders and on his hands with wood and feathers and jumped off a hill in Cordoba. And he was up in the air, they say, for some 10 minutes. And in recognition of his attempted flight, the city of Cordoba today has a huge bridge in the shape of wings. There's also a crater on the moon named after him. Now, he's not simply an adventurer, a man of imagination. He's also a scientist. He's, he writes literature. He's an astronomer. He's an inventor. And for him, flight is an expression of the human imagination, of human courage and curiosity. Now, Finas was at the early phase of the Golden Age. My other example is Umar Khayyam, who was at the tail end. Now, Khayyam, like Firnas, was an eminent man of science. He was an outstanding mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher. But he also wrote poetry. And this poetry was discovered and translated half a millennium later by Edward Fitzgerald in London. And not a single copy sold in the first year. But then Khayyam, suddenly his quatrains took off and they were wildly popular. In the 20th century, Hollywood discovered Khayyam making a movie on him and frequently citing him in their movies. Who has not heard of this Khayyam quatrain? The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half line. Nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Profound, deeply Sorrowful, but capturing the human condition. Now, the scholars were exemplary. We were impressed by them. But something was also driving the rulers, the people who were considered the role models in society. We have Abdul Rahman, who founded the Umayyad dynasty in Spain, and his successors who attempted to live up to the model of the just and compassionate Islamic ruler a model established by the Prophet of Islam himself. Now, Abdul Rahman was frequently seen in the grand mosque he built at Cordoba. He was seen sitting in a corner after prayer, deep in conversation with scholars and students. His grandson, Abdul Rahman, and Al-Hakam, the first, for example, faced an uprising in Cordoba of theological students. This is Al-Hakam, the Taliban of their day. Now, just think of this image. So the local Taliban of their day, religious scholars, who deemed the ruler insufficiently Islamic, they revolted. And there was an attack on the palace in Cordoba. Bloody attack. And one of the leading theological student rebels was brought before the ruler. And he was expecting to be put to death. And he said, I was simply obeying the voice of God. And al replied, a very profound reply, very relevant to our world. He said, he who commanded thee as thou dost pretend to hate me 
commands me to pardon thee, go and live in God's protection. And for all his power and wealth, even the Khalif would be chastised when he failed to attend Friday prayers as of the Raman third was by the senior cleric at the Grand Mosque after he had missed uh, three Friday prayers while building the Medina Zara. And then, of course, the very well-known figure of Sultan Salahuddin, although he's from what we call the Middle East and not Andalusia, but he's in that same period, same age, who after taking Jerusalem from the Crusaders, showed the world how to treat prisoners with compassion and kindness. He paid for those who could not afford their ransom from his own estate. So that's an example, I think, that is inspiring to all of us, especially in our time of violence and war. Cordoba itself, the capital of Andalusia, was centuries ahead of London and Paris, which at that time were little more than backward, dirty and dusty little towns. Cordoba had indoor plumbing. It had fresh water coming in and sewage water going out. The streets were lit and there were oil lamps. There were dozens of libraries and baths. And apart from the scientific, intellectual and cultural excellence, the architecture of the golden age was dazzling. And you can see examples for yourself uh, when you next visit Andalusia, the Grand Mosque in Cordoba, which is now the cathedral, and the Alhambra Palace in Granada, even though they were built a thousand years ago. And Spain today very proudly considers this, these the primary tourist attractions of, modern, of the modern nation. Now, I think it is time to talk a little bit about this phrase, the ilm ethos. As a scholar, I often contemplate the spectacular rise of Islam and then the equally spectacular decline of Islam. And I very often look at the causes, what is actually behind it, behind the first uh, rise and then the decline. Now, if the aim of Muslims is to lead a pious and contented life for themselves, the family and the community, to be able to educate their children and to maintain the traditions of their forefathers, and then pass them on to the next generation, the challenge is how to transmit this knowledge to the next generation, but also in a way that does not alarm and frighten the rest of the world. Which, by the way, as far as Muslims are concerned, it's, it's about one quarter uh, of the world population, about that, and some 60 nations who are Muslim. So in that sense, what is happening in the Muslim world is very important for the rest of the world to understand. So the rise comes from what I believe was the ill mythos. And this is important to understand because Islam's success is spectacular and people very often uh, blame that success to Islam's early success within a few years of the Prophet's uh, passing away in 632 AD. Within, within a few years, Islam had conquered the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, and it within a few years, it had spread from Spain in Europe to the Sindh in South Asia. It's, it's, it's spectacular. But what is causing that success? What is causing the emergence then very shortly after this early military success, the emergence of the golden age of scholars and architecture and poetry and astronomy and so on. And I believe that these are three concepts that come from Islam, from the Arab culture that Islam fostered. And they are ilm, ilm means knowledge, adal, which means justice, and esan, which means compassion, balance, kindness. So Muslims are constantly striving to achieve these three uh, features in their society. Now, when people define Islam, they would very, very often say it's the five pillars, prayers, fasting, and so on. But to me, those are very important, but they are mainly ritual. What is important in society to foster an Islamic society or a vision of an Islamic society is the ilm ethos, which comprises these three features. And one affects the other, they overlap and they trigger the others. You cannot have an ill mythos society without other, without justice, or without essence, without kindness. And you can see 
some of the Muslim dictators of our times, our own contemporary era like Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi, or the more democratically inclined leaders of South Asia who have a dem autocratic bent, wanting to suppress dissent and lining up against the ill mythos. So will they, they, they will not be happy for being reminded of the ill mythos, for being reminded that they are required as rulers, as leaders, as role models to give ilm and ethos and, and other and essence to their societies. So my first point here is, following the discussion of the ill mythos, that Muslim leaders themselves import, understand the importance of the ill mythos and begin to implement its values long, long overdue in the reformation that has not happened. So when we talked about, about a reformation in the Muslim world, this is it, to rediscover the ill mythos. And it must come from within. We have seen the failures to impose change from abroad repeatedly in the recent decades of this century alone. So in Islamic societies, the values of ilm, adal, and esan remain essential to understanding human behavior. They also reflect God's self-perception. The two most cited names of God's 99 names, God in the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, has 99 names. They are compassionate and beneficent and so on. But the two most popular names, which God himself selects and says, these are the names he wants to repeat, are Rahman and Rahim, which mean compassionate and beneficent. So those are the names that rulers must put before them and then aspire to them. And we must understand that there are global trends today within which we have, must have this discussion, which indicate the opposite, such as the rising nationalism, populism, and the retribalization of communities, uh, which we have argued in an article in the academic journal Anthropology Today. So I repeat that unless these three features are working together in Muslim society, in order to create a zeitgeist, uh, philosophy for the age, which promotes harmony and productivity, it will not work. Now, I've also pointed out in my writing and talking about the ill mythos that I'm creating an ideal, an ideal type, to quote Max Weber's uh, concepts of the ideal type. But the ideal type is really only an ideal type. So there are many times when the, in Andalusia, when Muslim societies collapse, there's an implosion, as happened with the uh, uh, with the Umayyads, the, the golden age of the golden age, and they are then removed, toppled, and their work is destroyed. Uh, almost tragically, for example, when the Umayyads are finally removed, when their dynasty destroyed, the new rulers set about destroying this beautiful city just outside Cordoba called Medina Zara. Abdul Rahman III had built that in honor of his wife. The name is Medina Zara. Zara was the name of his wife. It was a beautiful city. It was almost like Shangri-La. It was beautiful architecture. You can still see it in its ruins. It's, it's still well worth a visit when you're next uh, in uh, Andalusia. So there are times when Muslims are compromising their own understanding of the ill mythos, when they're misbehaving with the minorities, with each other, within the, the, the Within uh, Islam itself, the very nasty conflicts with sects, Shia, Sunni, and so on, all that is also before us. So we cannot pretend that it's simply something that has been airbrushed from history. And that's why I'm pointing that out. The Quran itself, and I'm getting the ill mythos concept from the Quran itself, uh, points to a state of Mizan. And Mizan is described as balance, the middle path. So it balances the different forces that uphold and shape society. And when that balance is upset, chaos follows. And this argument is eloquently presented in his recent book, Rethinking Islam in the West, by the English convert to Islam, Ahmad Keeler at Cambridge. So let me try to sum up 
uh, the characteristics of the golden age. The first and most important char characteristic was that there was respect for ilm, and this respect was pervasive. So whether you were Jewish or Christian or Muslim or atheist, and you were a scholar, you were respected, and very often respected across the span of the Muslim world. It's amazing how Ibn Battuta, coming from North Africa, is immediately appointed Ghazi or head cleric in the religious court in Cairo, in Delhi, and so on. Or Ibn Khaldun, leaving from Andalusia to North Africa, arrives in Cairo, and again becomes and is appointed a, a top a cleric in the religious courts. So number one, there is this pervasive respect and acknowledgement of knowledge. Number two, it's important to remember that this is not only the question of men. Women are very much involved in this search for ilm and knowledge. And there are many, many very, very powerful examples. The teacher of Ibn Arabi, one of the great philosophers and mystics of Islam at that time, again from Andalusia, although he traveled in the Middle East and uh, went to do the Hajj uh, several times and stayed in Mecca for several years. His teacher was a woman, the person who started Fez, the oldest university now in Morocco, still extant, still attracting students. Just imagine the, the time scale. It's in the thousand years before the time we are talking about. Again, was a woman. So women were Sufis, were scholars, and contributing to this uh, culture of ilm. It's a time, because of this appreciation and desire for knowledge, that new planets and stars are being discovered. And that's why so many stars have Arabic names. And new sciences, and I've just pointed out some of them to you. The second point I want to make is the age produced these great, great scholars and, and philosophers and scientists, but they were what would come to be called the Renaissance men, Renaissance men, men and women, men of science, but who also wrote poetry, who had this poetic imagination. And I gave you the example, for example, for example of Umar Khayyam, who's a great scientist, mathematician, and so on, but also a poet. And there were others uh, in this category. So the learned man or woman, the accomplished man or woman, was also someone who was very sensitive to the finer emotions that make us human and express this very often in poetry. And there's some brilliant poetry written by Muslims, by Jews, by Hindus, by whoever at that period of history. And this again is an aspect of that age when it brings together different cultures and different uh, societies. There's a very strong interfaith aspect, very strong interfaith aspect. And the presence of the other great religions in proximity, remember they're living together, acted as a stimulus to bring out the best in each other. Again, I repeat, there's conflict, there's war, but the positive side dominates that conflict. And there are many, many examples of interfaith harmony. The chief minister of Abdul Rahman III, the caliph of Andalusia in Cordoba, was a Jewish statesman and his ambassador, a Christian priest. Maimonides, the great rabbi and physician, worked as the medical advisor to the great Sultan Salahuddin. There was a flourishing of Jewish culture and commentators have called this period of history a golden age of Judaism. And I would like to point to Rabbi Maimonides, who wrote his masterpiece, Guide for the Perplexed, and St. Thomas Aquinas, who wrote his masterpiece, his magnum opus, Summa Theologica. And he quoted, Aquinas quoted, he'd been rushed over 500 times. So there was a great element of interfaith dialogue at that time. And another point, another characteristic of that period, is that these societies living in harmony, it's not simply we're looking at them through rose-colored glasses and saying, we all love each other, we're all good human beings, but they resulted, cause and effect, they resulted in creating societies that were very prosperous. When there's peace, there's prosperity. 
So it's a time of agricultural and economic progress. Olives, bananas, oranges, dates, coffee, tea, rice, aubergine, asparagus. All these are coming from outside Europe to Europe. And the countryside flourished. And hanging over this is a sophisticated philosophy of universal humanism. It embraces all different cultures and religions. And it balances the spiritual and the material, the here and the hereafter, the individual and the community. So Andalusia is allowing Muslims to play the historic role as a major bridge between the classical and the modern, between East and West. Now, there are excellent books on Andalusia and the Golden Age of Islam. Perhaps if I were to recommend one book, it would be Maria Rosa Menocal's The Ornament of the World. The subtitle carries the thesis of the book. Our Muslims, Jews, and Christians created a culture of tolerance in medieval Spain. It's a beautifully written book and captures the glory of that time. I have also attempted to write about it most recently in my study of Europe and after spending time in Andalusia. Journey into Europe, Islam, Immigration and Identity, and the book that Dr. Elvis kindly mentioned, The Flying Man, The Golden Age of Islam and Its Contribution to Science and Philosophy. Let me conclude my talk by mentioning the need to apply the ilm ethos today. So while we acknowledge and recognize very often, we don't know about that age, but we do now know because I'm putting it out there right in front, square, middle, center, and in front. We need to be aware also of how it can help us in today's world. I'm not advocating that we bring back that age. I'm simply saying that we have a time of history which gives us a glimpse on how societies can live together. So we don't want to repeat that era, it's gone, it cannot come back, but we can learn from it at a time when we really need considering the state of the world with all the conflicts, ethnic and religious conflicts, and the accompanying violence, how to live together as more peaceful societies. And if you have any doubt about that period and my argument, let me quote, let me quote the great late Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs, who explained the relevance of Andalusia brilliantly. So this is Lord Sachs. Andalusia is one of the most important facts about our present situation. The reason is when you talk about good relations between faiths at moments of high intensity conflict, people think you're being utopian. People just aren't that good. So what brings these aspirations from utopia to reality is the knowledge that we have been there before. Andalusia showed how it could be done and showed that it could be done. And because of that, for me, Andalusia is the single most important feature of our current situation. We have a precedent. We know what it looked like. So, let me conclude. The first big lesson we can take from the Golden Age is to fill the gap in our knowledge and information about Islam in the West and its age, its golden age. And I mention this because if you visit most of the museums today in the capitals of the West, and you look at the panels which describe world history, they go something like this. Greek, the Greek age, Roman age, then it skips into the dark age, thousand years of the dark age, and then into the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the modern era, the developments in America, the scientific age and the takeoff, colonization, and we are into where we are today. And you'll notice the dark ages are exactly where the golden ages of Islam fit. So not only people do not know about the golden age, but they, in fact, see that as the dark ages because they simply don't know. And I pointed out why it's important for people to have an understanding of the golden age. 
I am encouraged as an undergrad. I noticed that there weren't many chairs or departments of Islamic studies. Today, I am very encouraged to see throughout the United States, throughout the United Kingdom, there's so many centers of learning about Islam and history and culture outside a ethnic or religious or ethno-national perception of knowledge itself. So it is good that we begin to reach out and look at the golden age. And if you don't believe me later today, ask your friends, ask your relatives when you're talking to them uh, about the golden age and just ask them who they think discovered the camera obscura and the pinhole camera, who discovered algebra or algorithms or who attempted flight, who was the first person to attempt flight. Very often they'll say Leonardo da Vinci or the Wright brothers. And that itself will confirm that there needs to be much more knowledge. So with the state of the world as it is today, and when I talk about the spectacular decline of the Muslim world, I must point out again as a scholar, but also as a Muslim scholar, I am distressed and equally heartbroken to see the condition of especially minorities throughout the world, not just in one part of the world, but throughout the world, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's South Asia, whether it's China, you see the condition of the minorities. And the great global theories that we uh, use to analyze the world, for example, John Mersheimer's great power politics, he says they're basically four hegemons, America, Russia, China, and India as an emerging hegemon. You'll notice none of these are Muslim. There's no Muslim hegemon. So the result is that the almost 2 billion Muslims are lost in the, in the cracks and the abyss. They don't have a place in, these, in this uh, modern lineup of political philosophy. So what happens to them? Who represents their interests and who protects them? And that one of the results is that a lot of young men, a lot of young Muslim men, are moved into wrong directions and they end up by taking, an, taking action which increase the possibility of violence and more violence and more violence. And that's why I must point out the heroic example of women, Muslim women across the Muslim world, who are fighting for their rights. They're fighting for rights to be educated, for their rights to be uh, employed in jobs, media, education, and so on, and against very difficult, in very difficult circumstances and against great odds, but they are fighting. And it is a valid challenge, valid, valid, valid uh, clash, because you're seeing in Nigeria, for example, where women are literally lifted up and abducted and forced into marriage by the Boko Haram, or in Afghanistan, which tragically won't even allow women to be educated or get a job is as bad as that. And that is completely against the spirit of the Quran, which, which categorically addresses throughout the Quran, men and women, and constantly points to the high status of women within Islam itself. So in a sense, Muslims are doing things which they themselves should not be doing. And I think it's very important for us to talk about the golden age, especially for Muslim women and Muslim men, Muslim leaders and the young, so they, they understand that this is the inheritance, this is their legacy, and they should not just throw it away. Now, I mentioned John Mersheimer. There's another global theory which is very widely cited and popular, and that is, of course, the clash of civilizations, where the Muslim world is seen as a potential and permanent enemy of the West, forever poised to strike at its heart. That, again, is a misreading and miscalculation because the Muslim world is by no means united and cannot take united action, as we saw recently with this failure to act one way or the other over Gaza in spite of the high feelings of sympathy and anger for the suffering among Muslims. So Muslim leadership must realize that it cannot be business as usual. There must be far more self-analysis, more self-criticism. The leadership must implement a strategy for better relations with neighbors and have a greater understanding of what needs to be done within their own societies. 
starting with the state of education and the values inculcated in students. In this, they would be well guided by, by what we are calling the ill mythos. So not just books and ideas, but compassion and a notion of justice. And the West, and it's widely, widely discussed, even conceded, that the West is in a general state of decline. And one of the major reasons is its failure to guide the post 9-11 world with wisdom or compassion. An example is, it of, is of its dealing with the Muslim world, where it relies almost entirely on brute military power. Adoption of the ill mythos will create both understanding and the real possibility of a strategy to win over the Muslim world. The Muslim world needs colleges and schools and educational institutions, not missiles and bombs. Let us not forget that the ilm ethos is based in humanism and underlines the great achievements of Islam and the West alike. So it is well to remind the West of this as well, given the rise of the far right. What has been notably absent in the discussion today and the post 9-11 phase of our history is the notion, the lack of the notion of compassion, the basic human expression, which is at the core of the world's great faiths, whether it's Islam or Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism, compassion, that is missing. And let us remind ourselves that the ill mythos places compassion at its very heart. I believe that with the wars currently being experienced by our world society, we have wars in Europe, in the Middle East, and show no signs of baiting or ending. And commentators are already talking about the drift into the Third World War. I find this extremely alarming. We have simply, we seem to have dismissed and brushed aside the future generations. The images of newborn babies being slaughtered and shown almost daily on television, once seen, cannot be unseen. Perhaps it is time to rediscover this celebrated commandant, commandment of Jesus to love one another. It's one of his great commandments. Love one another. Perhaps Europe's gift of La Convivencia will help us recognize our common humanity. Thank you and once again, I would like to thank Dr. Elvis, Soaz, and all of you who have joined me uh, in this session. Thank you. Uh, that was that was excellent, uh, Professor Ahmed. Uh, it 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 was a lot to think about. Really, it it was um, not a, not a, a purely intellectual lecture. It was quite um, an emotional one as well, and I think it's it's the is the balance you spoke about um, uh, during your talk, having that balance, which we seem to have lost between uh, knowledge and compassion that the ethos has between material, materiality and spirituality, between um, these, uh, having that harmony, that, that balance. And I think that's what we lack and the ethos could help us start thinking about again. Um, yesterday I was concluding a paper on the ontology of waste, um, drawing heavily from the African traditions, which is my area of expertise. And what what became quite clear to me is, uh, is that when we talk about ecological problems, they often emerge as well from this disruption of balance, you know, in our ecosystem and how Asian traditions had that balance, you know, uh, a bit African traditions or the golden age of uh, Islamic thought and, and so on. Um, but my, my to, 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 to begin the sort of Q and A, um, I'm taking the privilege here. Um, my 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 main worry often is that um, I write that paper as I was doing yesterday. It it ends up in a journal article somewhere or a book chapter. Um, you've given this fantastic, excellent talk, which perhaps is better than the textual because it's then available for quite a number of people to watch on YouTube. How do we get this knowledge? to the grassroots, to those who really need to hear it, to the young people, to, to communities. And I think this is, um, so this is the, this is the actual uh, point that um, one, one of our um, uh, 
uh, guest today, Dr. Amine Hoti, if I got that right, uh, put on the chat. Um, uh, Dr. Hoti says, excellent talk, very inspiring and timely. Thank you. How can young people be inspired again by the important knowledge based uh, on ethos? So again, how do we bring this to the larger public? Uh, I think that's my question. Well, Dr. Elvis, thank you for asking that question. Thank you for your comments. Uh, it's a, a very important, relevant question. And thanks uh, to Dr. Hoti for raising this question. And the answer is the work of scholars like you, like Dr. Hoti, who spent several years in the field in Pakistan and uh, wrote about uh, field experiences, and in that sense reached out to a wider audience. So the challenge is really ours as scholars. Uh, how do you get these ideas into the media? And here you have a problem because the media is not interested in scholarly ideas or scholarly discussions. They give you very little time and they would like conflict. So in the media, if you're in dialogue with a, a Jewish rabbi or a Christian priest, they would like to see a conflict because that helps their ratings. They're only interested in ratings. So sometimes I've been on television and I've got three minutes or two minutes in which to explain the golden age of Islam or how to build bridges. So that is a challenge. I think, I think that we also have an advantage in living in this era, this technology, technological era, where we have all these different outlets. We have um, television, we have uh, our discussion, we are talking across the Atlantic Ocean uh, through this marvel of Zoom. So we have these different methods with which we can propagate, we can share our information. So I really think scholars have to be much more active and I would even say that they have to change their method and their style into this century because traditional scholarship, I know that my early books were very restricted. And I was given this advice by some friends in the media who said, look, Akbar, one of my first books was written when I was at Suez, and um, it was called Millennium and Charisma Among Pathans. It was a highly anthropological book, which maybe 10 people read. And my friend said, look, Akbar, it's a an anthropological book. It's got high status reviewed in all the anthropology journals. But how many people have read it? How many people will have been mm. impacted by it? So that is why you've got to. So I was very lucky because eventually I got the BBC interested and they made a six part television series called, uh, uh, based on my book, Discovering Islam. Their series was called Living Islam, six hours on television. BBC meant a lot of people saw it. So that is a challenge that we have to accept and be part of. And that is a problem because we are not, I wasn't trained to uh, work or speak in the media. Uh, scholars are very often shy from appearing on television and uh, mm -hmm. which has its own rules and the way you dress and appear and speak and so on. So uh, I remember an irate young lady who was running a, a BBC discussion with me at early stages in my career in the media and while I was giving an answer to a question, she was asking questions from behind a, a screen. And she asked a question and I started as a scholar saying on the one hand, on the other hand. And she stormed into the, opened the door, came into a booth. And she said, can't you scholars speak like human beings? Instead of giving long lectures, no one is interested in just cut to the chase, give us the actual. And that shook me. I said, it's a very cheeky young girl. Yeah. But it made me think and it helped me to try to frame it in a way where people then understood this. So mm -hmm. this is a very important challenge, uh, Dr. Elvis, and I hope you raise it in different forums because scholars must respond to it. You've got this incredible learning mm -hmm. scholarship which everyone would benefit from, and yet very few people know about it. And as a result, your voice is not heard. Mm -hmm. Who is heard today? In the mm -hmm. media, you'll see people with extremist views, with populist views, far-right views. Scholars are not heard so often. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Um, uh, feel free to uh, raise your digital hand and um, if you want to uh, ask a question, I, I have a shoot. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sajid. Yeah, I think your hand went up at the moment. Uh, Hi, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Professor Akbar, for this wonderful talk. 
Uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, and it really speaks very loud. So I've, I've posted my question already here, but since I have the time to ask it, I would rather take the honor and privilege to ask you directly. Thank I totally you so agree. much, Sajad. Thank you, Sajad. Yeah, I totally agree with your theories and what you presented, but I really wonder, being a graduate of SOAS, you know, completing my PhD at SOAS in 2011, and now trying to work in like as a community leader and also maintain my academia as well, I find it very challenging and very difficult uh, and this is exactly, I think, what you pointed out. So isn't it a time when our religious leaders, especially imams uh, who are actually uh, working in the West, that they ought to be affiliated with some credible academic institution? And what gives me some inspiration is the example of Ibn Rushd Averroes himself, who was the head imam in Cordoba, who was a chief justice, who was a scientist, who was a great scholar, and many others that, like you, are actually pointing out to in mm. your... Uh, study. So please give us some advice, practical advice on how to facilitate for this, because I think that is the next stage we ought to take in the West. Uh, excellent uh, comment, Sajad, and uh, I appreciate your thinking. Thank you. uh, let me tell you the book, The Flying Man, which uh, Dr. Elvis mentioned, that has a blurb given by the chief rabbi of Bosnia, Dr. Hussein. It has a blurb uh, recommending that the book be read, etc. It was very kind of him to give that blurb. So it isn't a hopeless struggle. You have to reach out as scholars to the imams, to the priests, to the rabbis, and include them in this conversation. Very often we don't. We very often scholars are living, I'm sorry to say, in a state of ivory towers. We are ourselves <laughs> isolated. And we feel that's not part of our job. And it isn't. It really isn't. But because of the larger argument, which I pointed out in my own experience in, in, my, in my lifetime, I believe it is an urgent need for Muslim scholars, non-Muslim scholars to reach out. And as you say, to reach out to people like the religious imams, priests, rabbis who have a platform and they have a congregation. So I'm giving an example that it is possible. I quoted Lord Jonathan Sachs, uh, who was chief rabbi of the United yeah. Kingdom in the in the UK, mm. and I'm I'm very glad to say that and very proud to say that that statement he gave on Andalusia is one of the most powerful I have come across. Where he cl clearly points out that here's a model for society which can be duplicated because it did succeed. We have it in front of us in history, and he gave that to me in my office in in Washington. So this dialogue with rabbis and with priests is ongoing and we must appreciate it and encourage it. Mm, mm, interesting. I think the, 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 the point you just made uh, uh, is, is the one reiterated by Mahmoud uh, in the chat um, because it, again it's this whole idea of scholars or academics uh, focusing on theory and drawing again a distinction or a dichotomy between theory and practice you know um, and trying to sort of bridge that gap again the balance uh, and Mahmoud says uh, thank you it is not is it not by example that one can spread the message rather than just talking writing about it so I think it's 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 sort of reiterate what you were just saying um not not walking detached away or in isolation from the real world um uh, academia needs to be much more um uh, applied and in practice with, with every day. Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's why, Dr. Yeah, Elvis, yeah. I gave you the example of Journey into Europe, my project, my last big project, in which I spent several years going up and down Europe with a team uh, of very bright assistants and scholars, literally all across Europe, to try to write about Europe, but through the filter of the Muslim experience. Mm. So, again, in the field, uh, meeting people, sometimes facing some kind of tension, because there is tension. You can't pretend it's not happening. But again, that's part of the game. It's part of the, the heat which comes when you're in the kitchen. Yeah, true. Thank you. Um, any, other, uh, any other question from the audience? Uh, feel free to raise your digital hand. I'll, I'll just check through the chat. Um, I think there is one on the chat. Uh, so it's if if we are to assume that there was a decline after a golden age, 
uh, what would you say are the causes uh, of this decline? Is it the relinquishment of the of this aim ethos? Uh, if so, then what was the cause of that relinquishment of uh, of the Islamic society relinquishment of this particular aim ethos? So basically, what was the cause? What was what led to the decline? Yes. Of this ethos? Yeah. Well, decline. There's a big debate about this. What caused the eventual decline of the Muslims and the loss, the spectacular loss uh, of the loss of political power, the loss of economic power. And I think if you take one cause, there are many causes, but if you take one cause, I believe it would be the loss of education, the loss of that spirit of acquiring knowledge. Uh, and here's an example. Take a look at the Muslim world and its state of education today, right across the Muslim world. Take a look at the budget and then see how much money is allocated for education. It's tiny amounts, 1%, 2%. Take a look at the budget allocation for the military or for the presidential palace or for the facilities of the government. And you'll see the disproportion. And that itself tells you the story. And then you see the treatment of scholars. And as I mentioned briefly, the dictators in the Muslim world like Saddam Hussein or Gaddafi, one of their first targets will be the Muslim scholar. Because it's the Muslim scholar who will say, hey, wait a minute, what you're doing is not an example of a good ruler or even a Muslim ruler, and this must stop. And of course, they become the target. As a Muslim scholar told me, uh, he, he gave me a quote which is in, in my book. He said, we Muslim scholars face the religious scholars, the, the imams in the, this world, and we face hell or jahannam in the next world. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because in this world, the imams say, you're not a good Muslim, you're asking too many questions as scholars. And the rulers say, if you don't behave the way I want you to behave, we'll just simply remove you, exterminate you, kill you. So he said, we are caught between jahannam, that's hell, the Muslim word for hell, and jail, being put into jail by the rulers. And that's a dilemma that Muslims face today. But again, it's a phase in history, and I hope we'll come out of that phase and we'll reach a stage when Muslims will begin to appreciate that at core, Islam advocates knowledge, justice, and compassion. Mm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmed. I think that question was from Tariq. Uh, Tariq, do you want to speak up? I think you had a second question. Seemed, I think to have missed it up in the chat. Now, um, if you'd like to ask directly. Sure, I can. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm just in a bit of a loud place. So it's no worries, it's fine, but, Tariq. Um, Thank you so much. I, I'm I'm working as sort of I work from the kind of on the medieval period and I work on education systems in the medieval period and so on. So this is a really important topic for me. So thank you so much for this talk. I, I guess um <laughs> to go back to the theoretical, because that's what I kind of work in, that some scholars would assume would have issues with the framing of a golden age decline uh, binary because it then assumes that after this golden age period that nothing of substance emerges in the Islamic world mm -hmm. after the golden age ends. Um, so um, I guess, how do we address this? Because I think that um, there's obviously a lot going on. And as you said, there's many, many different causes for for a decline, if we're to assume that there is a decline. So but how, how do we address this, um, this sort of this idea that nothing of substance emerges in the Islamic world after after the decline, after the golden age ends? Thank you. Well, Tariq, I'm talking about ideal types, as I said, that you know, you're writing in an academic frame. So uh, Weber's ideal type is very important to understand my own thesis, that there is an ideal type. You're trying to create that simply as a straw man so that you can have an argument. And if that is the case, then there's also the end of the golden age and then the decline. And the decline is uh, reflected in this educational standards, the violence in Muslim societies, the lack of justice, the complaint you'll hear, right across the board uh, of ordinary Muslims from not having access to justice or to um, peace or to prosperity. You may have some places for some periods of time when you have these things and there's that's the hope you have. 
where you have some enlightened ruler, enlightened period of history, even today. But those are short-term periods. I would like to see a more permanent, a more determined, a more coherent flame, frame for Muslim societies for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been, this, this has been very um, interesting engagement, I would say. Um, if there's any one more, perhaps a final question, anyone wants to give it a go, uh, you can raise your hand and, um, or we allow uh, Professor Ahmed to, to enjoy his day now. It was an early rising to join this um, from Washington this morning. Mm. Okay, I mean, uh, the conversation goes on. Uh, we all need to keep thinking about how, how best to bring these um, important and relevant ideas uh, into real life situations and not just um, in, in our public lectures or in our books, or in, our, in our libraries, uh, but really make it count in, in, in everyday life. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Ahmed. It was really a pleasure. Uh, to listen to you and to have you here today. Um, and thank you all who, who were able to join. Uh, it made it very lively. Um, and um, looking forward to more uh, conversations in the future, Professor Ahmed. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me this platform and being a kind and compassionate host. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, our next lecture will be in the last Friday of October. Uh, that will be on uh, a theme in African philosophy. So we're looking forward to that. And the next one in November will be in uh, Indian philosophy. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep thawing these different traditions and see what we can learn from them. Uh, enjoy your weekend, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.